All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming, for arriving right on time. Um, we will be starting in, in just a moment. Um, really uh, excited about the conversation we're gonna be having today. Uh, so today um, we are having a conversation about the Supreme Court and election reform. Uh, we have an absolutely terrific panel this afternoon, really excited to get into this conversation, these topics. Um, it is an especially important time to be having these conversations uh, with two recent significant cases regarding voting rights and election law um, decided just this most recent term. So Allen versus Milligan and Moore versus Harper. And in some cases that could have implications for the election reform space upcoming. So uh, next term, there will be Alexander versus South Carolina Conference of the NAACP. Um, and, you know, potentially future cases uh, on the meaning of more, we will see. Um, this webinar is the latest in a series of webinars, ongoing series. So um, you can find others, uh, including discussions with some of the leading experts in the election reform world on our YouTube, which is youtube.com slash fairvote, uh, as well as our other social media channels. Uh, we are Fair Vote Reform on Facebook, and we are at Fair Vote on Twitter, if I can continue to call it Twitter. Um, I am Mike Parsons, Senior Legal Fellow at Fair Vote and Principal at Parsons Law PLLC. Uh, I'm going to be your host for this afternoon with the honor of putting forth the first question to our distinguished panel panelists. Um, but we do really want this to be a conversation, and so we're really eager to include all of you attending as well. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to place them in the Q&A box, uh, and you can go ahead and do this at any time, so don't feel like you need to wait till uh, question and answer at the end. Um, if, if something pops into your head, go ahead and drop it in there, and we'll, we'll come back around to it at the end. So uh, let's go ahead and meet our panelists. Uh, I'm joined by four panelists today, um, all distinguished experts in facets of election law, reform, and policy. Uh, so first, Guillermo Charles is the Charles J. Ogletree Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, where he also directs the Charles Ham Hamilton Institute for Race and Justice. He writes about how law mediates political power and how law addresses racial subordination. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Law Institute, and he's the co-author of two textbooks, one on law and democracy, of which I'm a big fan, uh, the other on race and law, which I'll have to dig into. I haven't read it yet. So that's up next on the reading list. Uh, we have written over 40 law review articles. Uh, not we. He has written over 40 law review articles. I'd love to team up with you in the future, Key. Uh, and is currently working on a book about the Voting Rights Act uh, and a book about the law of race. Uh, Gilda R. Daniels is a professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, Professor Daniels is a former deputy chief in the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division voting uh, section. Uh, she's also served as litigation director at Advancement Project National Office supporting the Justice, Education, Immigrants' Rights, and Voting Projects, uh, a staff attorney at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and currently serves as a consultant at Campaign Legal Center. Um, she's the author of Uncounted, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America, uh, and her scholarship focuses on the intersections of race, law, and democracy. Uh, her law review articles have appeared in various prestigious publications, and she clerked in the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit uh, with the Honorable Joseph uh, W. Hatchett. She is a graduate of New York University School of Law, where she was a Root Tilden Scholar, uh, and Grambling State University. Uh, all right, on to Chris Shenton, is the Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Uh, Chris graduated from NYU School of Law in May 2021. Uh, I actually taught at NYU School of Law for a little bit, so we've got a really stacked NYU School of Law panel here today uh, representing. During this time, during his time in law school, he worked with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the ACLU Voting Rights Project, and the Fair Housing Justice Center uh, as a student advocate in the Civil Rights Clinic uh, and as a research assistant at the Furman Center for uh, Real Estate and Urban Policy. Uh, Chris also served as editor-in-chief of the NYU Journal of Legislation and Public Policy and helped run a services clinic for unhoused New Yorkers at the St. Xavier Soup Kitchen. Uh, Chris believes that the law should help make the systems that serve society work better for more people with no one left behind. Uh, I will plus one to that. Uh, Terrence Carroll was the 54th speaker of the Colorado House of Representatives. Uh, he's the only African-American to have served as speaker of the Colorado House. Terrence served in the legislature from 2003 until being term limited in 2011. 
I'd like you include that, Terrence. The people wanted the people wanted more Terrence, but term limited. They just can't have more Terrence. So uh, Terrence has been listed by 5280 Magazine as one of the 50 most influential people in Denver. Uh, he's the senior fellow for voting and democracy at Fair Vote. Uh, he's also an opinion columnist for the Denver Post, as well as a distinguished guest lecturer in the Master of Public Policy program at the University of Redlands in California. Uh, Terrence is a graduate of public policy program at the University of Redlands in California. Um, Terrence, sorry, Terrence is a graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, and holds a Master of Divinity degree from the ILIF School of Theology in Denver, and he is an ordained Baptist minister. Uh, so as I indicated, we have a very prestigious uh, panel here today, really excited to jump into these questions about the intersection of the what the Supreme Court is doing and what it means for election reform in the United States today. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, Professor Charles, I'd love to send the first question to you. So um, you've written in the past in, in your scholarship uh, and other publications about the importance of building uh, an inclusive politics in election law and policy. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could tell us sort of what you see as being at stake for building an inclusive politics this past term uh, in Milligan, what the court decided in Milligan, and sort of what the implications might be for the reform landscape moving forward. Sure, happy to, and it's a pleasure to be with you, Mike, and to be uh, with some of my colleagues. Um, it's good to see Professor Daniels, again, whose work and scholarship I admire, and it's great uh, to meet Mr. Carroll as well as um, Mr. Chris uh, Shelton. Um, all right, so uh, first let me just start with what the court decided in Milligan, and then I'll close briefly with um, what I think is at stake. So Milligan is a case that the court decided this past term, uh, the central question was whether the congressional districting plan adopted by the state of Alabama violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. The case arose from three separate lawsuits filed by three uh, sets of plaintiffs saying that, look, Alabama's redistricting, congressional redistricting plan diluted the votes of, of Black voters uh, because it only created one district in which Black voters constituted a majority of the district's population submerging uh, Black citizens in three districts in which they had no chance of electing a representative of their choice. And they were, they were seeking a second majority minority district. Uh, the lower court granted their request for preliminary relief on the ground that they'll likely prove at trial that Alabama violated Section 2 of the VRA. Alabama then went up to the Supreme Court, sought a stay of the lower court's decision, uh, the court then uh, docketed the case, granted the state, docketed the case for all argument, and then issued its opinion uh, this past term. Uh, in a way that was surprising, I think, to many court watchers, um, the court essentially um, sided with the lower, the court sided with the lower courts and with the plaintiffs. Um, what's fascinating about the case is that Alabama's challenge really um, leveled um, a dart, um, an arrow at the heart of Section 2 of the VRA. If you think of Section 2 of the, the VRA essentially as the mechanism for assuring multiracial democracy in the United States, or you could think of it as a remedial mechanism for addressing um, racial vote dilution against voters of color. And Alabama was essentially saying, look, um, this statute, which is race conscious in nature, um, should be interpreted in a race blind way. So just a very quick primer, um, in a landmark case called Thornburg versus Jingles, the court articulated three preconditions that a plaintiff must show. You know, plaintiff has, in order to make a prima facie case, that a voting district diluted their vote. So they have to show that they have the ability to elect a representative of their own because they're big enough and compact enough. They have to show that they could in fact elect someone because they're politically cohesive. So they're big uh, and compact as well as politically cohesive. And then lastly, they have to show that their inability to elect their preferred candidate is not because they're not large or not because they're not politically cohesive, but because of race. That is because the majority votes as a block to defeat their preferred 
candidate. And then once they do that, those are called the jingles preconditions, then they have to also show under a catch-all totality of circumstances approach that the political process is the um, is not as open to them as it is to the majority. Um, Alabama was not challenging saying that, hey, the lower court interpreted the law wrong. Instead, Alabama was saying that, look, um, in order for a plaintiff to meet those preconditions, they have to show that in a race blind universe, uh, when race wasn't taken into account, that the jingles three preconditions were violated. So really what Alabama was trying to do was to fundamentally undermine the framework of section two of the VRA. A majority of the court disagreed, led by Justice Chief Justice Roberts, which I think many people would have been surprised by, and really defended the opinion and Milligan defended the framework of section two and vote dilution. So from the perspective of the status quo, this is a fairly strong opinion. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, um, I mean, there's a concurrence by uh, Justice Kavanaugh, essentially saying, hey, the constitutional question is still up for grabs, um, relying upon, in many ways, the court's recent affirmative action decision, it's basically saying Congress can only require race to be taken into account for so long um, before then we put a limit on it like the court did in the affirmative action context. So right now for the moment, it's pretty clear that the, that the opinion is a strong defense, but there's um, definitely a message um, and, the, and, and from the case, particularly the concurrence of Justice Kavanaugh saying that, hey, this is a temporizing move that we're going to think about the larger question. And, and you're basically seeing both Alabama and South Carolina taking advantage of that and will go back up to the court and, and, and make that argument. So the, the, uh, for, the, for reform, um, the questions are not over. Um, we still like the, the, the play will still we're still in act two, essentially. Um, and what we need to, to think about is what is the future going to look like. But for now, the court gave a pretty strong defense of the status quo. And I'll stop here. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Charles. Yeah, it's I, I feel like we are in the middle of act two. And the reform question is, how does act two end? So that's kind of partially up to us. Um, speaking of which, uh, Professor Daniels, you actually worked with uh, Evan Milligan's group, the plaintiff, named plaintiff, um, Alabama Forward, and other Alabama-based organizations working on redistricting issues. Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your work, what you see as kind of the practical real world consequences of decisions like Milligan and um, you know the importance of grassroots organizing to these outcomes. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. And I am honored to certainly be on this prestigious panel with my friend, Guy Charles, and certainly meeting uh, Mr. Carroll as well as Mr. Shinton. Uh, so again, thank you for having me today. Uh, and unfortunately, Mike, I don't think we talk enough about the real world implications of these cases, uh, certainly, which is one of the things that I try to do in my book, Uncounted, and certainly in my work. And that, you know, we have these cycles, right? This cyclical work, like in particularly we're looking at Alabama from the Montgomery bus boycott to Selma, right? To, to now to, to Milligan, right? Certainly Alabama's really been uh, ground zero for certainly for, for acts of discrimination, voter discrim discrimination, but also for certainly the groundswell of grassroots organizing. Uh, and it's the people on the ground who are doing the work and they are certainly, I think we certainly have to consider that they are more than names of plaintiffs, right? They are people who are making sacrifices and are certainly putting their uh, names uh, and, and, and uh, prestige on the line in order to bring these cases. And I've had the pleasure, I have the pleasure of working with certainly uh, Evan Milligan and Alabama Forward, Alabama Values and uh, the Alabama Election Protection Network in kind of looking at certainly what's, what, what the work they did during the 2021 redistricting cycle and certainly as it continues, right? As in, in trying to look forward as to what can happen uh, uh, differently, certainly as we move to 2030. So that's the work that I'm working on with them. And it's, it's actually been a privilege and an honor and continues to be working with them in order to develop strategies for success, certainly for uh, the next round of, of redistricting. And I think it's important to recognize that during this 2021 redistricting cycle, these all of these organizations, not just in Alabama, but throughout the 
country certainly were working under the pandemic, right? They were working under a pandemic where uh, certainly uh, he'd been having legislative hearings or uh, certainly around the census and doing uh, community organizing and community education. They were limited in the means by which they could actually accomplish those goals. And so for organizations like uh, Alabama Forward and others to, to have the to be able to coordinate and collaborate with other organizations uh, to create certainly this um, groundswell of support and opposition uh, to uh, certainly what's going on in Alabama is enormous. And particularly in a place like Alabama, where you not only had to, you were fighting against the pandemic and, and had limited and had limitations in regards to the things, kinds of things that you could do, but also you have a supermajority in the, in the, in the state house. Uh, and certainly despite efforts by certainly a number of organizations in Alabama, none of their options were being considered and thus you have the litigation and ultimately the Supreme Court decision. But some of the practical implications of certainly the, the process was a loss of electoral opportunity, right? We just talked about Kavanaugh's uh, uh, certainly uh, concurring opinion in the uh, Allen versus Milligan case, but prior to that, you know, Kavanaugh's is the justice who said uh, in regards to the federal district court opinion uh, that we that they needed to use with the Purcell principle uh, in order to uh, to hear the case, right? So you have a federal district court that issued a 227 page opinion and said that this plan was discriminatory and that uh, uh, the, that it violated certainly violated the law. And instead of the court looking at the merits of the uh, of the case, it decided that it would use the Purcell principle, which essentially says that to avoid chaos, you don't want to make election changes too close to an election. And in this instance, this is a decision that was made in February, and the election was in November. Uh, and so the court um, used that in order to um, to allow this discriminatory plan to go forward. Uh, during the 2022, um, the 2022 uh, midterm elections. Uh, and, so, and so instead of having two uh, majority minority districts uh, in Alabama, they, will, oh, they only had one during the 2022 election. And I think it's important to say that this, this is really not a Democratic or Republican thing. This is an American thing. And so we're talking about the loss of democracy and denying citizens an opportunity to participate equally to elect their candidates of choice. Um, and certainly, you know, using this racial discriminatory gerrymander denied the opportunity to elect candidates of choice in the 2022 midterm. And, and it also allowed them to weaponize the per se um, principle. And so these organizations are, you know, continuing continue to work and continue to fight. But it, but in the reality is that it, what what this case, uh, how this case materialized, it meant that that there were real people uh, and real voters and real Americans who were not being allowed to actually participate equally in the process. Thank you so much, Professor Daniels. I mean, actually, so speaking of the Purcell principle and how it was invoked last time. Um, this is maybe just a question for the panel, anyone who wants to jump in. Uh, what is going on in Alabama right now, speaking of Purcell and what what seems to be afoot? Um, so I just thought I would ask, you know, Milligan happens, everyone says, you know, a sigh of relief, section two is is sort of at least safe for now. Um, and then it goes back down to remand, everyone thinks, okay, it's it's solved. Time to implement the new map. Uh, that is not the case. So I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, Chris, Professor Daniels, uh, whoever wants to take this one. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to start. Well, you know, the the after the remand, the uh, legislature it had a special se session uh, where they were to draw maps, certainly per pursuant to the Supreme Court's opinion, which essentially said draw two. Uh, to majority uh, minority districts in this uh, plan, because if you remember in Alabama, African-Americans are 27% of the population. Uh, and so if, out of seven districts, certainly there's an argument that in the Supreme Court essentially said you should have, they should be if they are able to draw two districts out of the seven that would be uh, majority black. So instead of doing that, uh, the legislature decided that it would draw uh, a, a district that was 50% uh, African-American and another one that is 39% African-American. So instead of drawing uh, two districts that would comply with the Supreme Court 
uh, opinion, it decided that it would only uh, draw one. Now, what is happening now is that the uh, that there's a hearing set in the district court for August 14th, and the question is whether or not uh, the map remedy the Section 2 violation. Now, the, the state has said that it's going to, it, that it wanted to try to use the August 14th hearing uh, to relitigate uh, uh, the, the, the previous case. Uh, and they also say that they uh, uh, drafted the plan in an effort to once again, take the case up to the Supreme Court uh, so that they can uh, uh, relitigate certainly the, the viability of uh, section two of the Voting Rights Act. So it's, it, it, you know, one of the things that I learned uh, is that, you know, we play the game, they write the rules, we win the game, they change the rules. And so essentially the, you know, you won the case, now it goes back to the same <laughs> structure in order to try to get a remedy and instead of doing what uh, the court, uh, what the court instructed it to do, it decided it was going to change the rules and actually literally change the rules in that they had also adopted new um, criteria in regards to what's a community of interest uh, and other other you know other criteria so they could you know now change the rules uh, and, 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 and so that you know we, we certainly so that they could certainly uh, alter who wins the game. Thank you, Professor uh -huh. Daniels. Uh, as we sort of, uh, before I move on beyond Milligan, um, Terrence would love to hear your thoughts on what you think for the implications for Milligan might be for, um, you know, election reform specifically for sort of fair votes, uh, reforms around ranked choice voting, proportional ranked choice voting, um, how those might relate to each other. Uh, thanks, Mike. And um, again, I'm I'm very um, blessed and honored to be on this panel with these esteemed guests. I'm just a simple country lawyer who used to be a politician. Um, so I'm just happy that, you know, in all my simplicity as a country lawyer, I get to be with these big city lawyers, even though I do live in a big city. Uh, but to get to the, your question at hand, um, Milligan is very important to the work of Fairvote, especially in light of our connection at Fairvote to the late great Lonnie Guineer and her interest in proportionality and how important the idea of proportionality is. Um, Fairvote is really engaged right now in some legislation that we would like to see enacted at the federal level called the Fair Representation Act, which gets at the heart of many of the issues raised in Milligan. And in this case that we also see coming out of South Carolina right now, um, Alexander, and some of the cases that are in Wisconsin at the very moment that the Wisconsin Supreme Court's going to hear about racial gerrymandering. Um, and, and, and it's another issue related to that. But one of the ideas behind this idea of proportional representation Representation and more specifically, proportional ranked choice voting. We, we get at something that Lonnie Grenier talked about when she says every citizen has the right to equal legislative influence. And oftentimes what we see um, in these attempts in gerrymandering, and especially in the racial context, you either pack or you crack the court when it comes to redistricting. And what we're seeing in Alabama is this attempt to actually pack um, African-American folks in one district, which really dilutes their ability, African-Americans, the ability of African-Americans to elect a candidate of their choice, especially in a state like Alabama that has a 27% of population, 25% of the population coming on at 30% is African-American, but yet there's only ability to elect one African-American in the entire state of Alabama. That seems pretty uh, illogical when you think about it. One of the things that we see with ranked choice voting, it encourages this idea of coalition building, coalition voting, so that African-Americans and in some other states, uh, voters of uh, color or marginalized voters have the ability to elect a candidate of their choice, their opportunity to elect a candidate of their choice. Under the current system, unless, you know, unless the Supreme Court goes back to its previous views of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, that the future possibility of African-American voters, Latino voters, other marginalized groups being able to elect the person to their choice is going to be limited because this idea of racial gerrymandering seems to be on its way out, or at least the court's opposition to it. PRCB allows the opportunity 
for a broader representation of people to be elected. The political problem with it, however, is that it also starts to dilute the strength of the duopoly of the two-party system. So we could see different coalitions come to play, which I'm here for. I mean, I'm not opposed to that because we're a very diverse and becoming a more diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural democracy. And no two parties can really catch the full diversity of the American people. And so Milligan really, I'm not going to say it benefits us because I don't want to be Ron DeSantis and say that certain something that's bad for us benefits us. Because one of the things we see of Kavanaugh is that we probably shouldn't be cheering Milligan that much because the Supreme Court still is on their path of, you know, we don't pretend like race doesn't exist. And so I'm not going to jump ahead to a future question, but it does raise a specter of what should states be doing in order to protect its voters. And I know that's, you know, a later question, but you know, I think the role of the states are very important. Uh, it shouldn't, it, it, that's both good and bad, but we'll get to that um, later, I believe, in the webinar. Thank you, Terrence, appreciate it. Um, so speaking of, you know, Supreme Court trying to pretend that race does not exist, um, Professor Daniels, in your book, Uncounted, you talked about, and you just talked about recently also sort of the cycles of voter access and suppression in America. Um, but you've also written about the importance of what you call um, voting realism um, for sort of charting a path forward for reform and for advocacy. Um, and so, you know, I was wondering if you could sort of share the concept of voting realism, um, you know, what that means and what you think it means for sort of reformers when we're thinking, you know, how do we get uh, an equitable, truly representative multiracial democracy? Mike, you're just nerding out on the, <laughs> the law review articles. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I love so, <laughs> so voting realism is certainly the recognition that race and racism influence certainly the voting process and, and influences our systems. And uh, voting realism was written to certainly serve as a framework for combating voter discrimination. I wrote the, uh, the article voting realism at a time certainly when it appeared that scholars and courts were moving away from race consciousness, race conscious uh, uh, remedies in particular, and more towards uh, race um, neutral. And certainly what voting realism suggests is that the focus should not limit, should not limit remedies to um, an either or approach. Uh, and, you know, many were arguing that we can only look at race neutral options as, as, as opposed to considering you know, race neutral as well as race conscious, um, um, race conscious um, 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 conclusions. Uh, and but it, the the voting realism was based loosely on certainly uh, Professor Derek Bell's article, racial realism, where he provided certainly the harsh conclusion that the quest for racial equality was futile and that racism is permanent, uh, as well as on uh, Professor Strentney's uh, article. Uh, it also talked about racial realism, but he also, he, what he talked about was that we can actually use race and consider the benefits um, of race. So what uh, the racial, what voting realism says is let's just accept that certainly race, uh, race has a part in certainly creating these um, creating these remedies, as well as looking at our systems and determining whether to what extent uh, race, as well as racism, play in, in 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 providing remedies. And that we should also it challenges us to be more imaginative in regards to outcomes and remedies. In that, we, let's look at what what is the larger goal, right? If the larger goal is universal suffrage or equity or fairness or you know increased participation. What kinds of systems, policies, uh, uh, practices can uh, we adopt that can achieve those larger goals? And certainly, what it does is argue that we should use all the tools in the toolbox. And you know, while we have Section Two, let's continue to use Section Two. I've certainly worked with organizations and uh, attorneys who are like, well, we can't use Section Two anymore because this court is going to take away. Well, they haven't yet. And since they haven't yet, let's continue. Let's continue to use it. And so, a voting a, a voting realist approach would certainly include advocating for an affirmative right uh, to vote in the United States um, Constitution as well. Uh, and so, I know there there are scholars who certainly uh, don't see a benefit uh, in that, but certainly you know certainly 
one of the things that could um, be achieved is certainly certainly having a guaranteed uh, uh, simply if we have a uh, a right to vote amendment that simply guarantees citizens an explicit constitutional right to vote, it certainly will rise to the level of other protected rights, such as the right to free speech uh, um, and to practice uh, uh, religion of your choice. I say often that you know it's easier to get a gun in some states than it is to register to vote. Uh, and uh, and because you know, they see this, 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 the Second Amendment as, as untouchable, right? Why isn't the right to vote uh, in, this, in, a, in, a, in a similar way, right? That could have an explicit right, certainly, which would make it much harder for states to employ certainly these divisive tactics, uh, certainly that inhibit the exercise of the franchise. And so, you know, just one example of certainly what uh, voting realism would say, let's be more imaginative about certainly the kinds of things that we should look for, not just, you know, only looking at certainly section two of the Voting Rights Act, or only look, looking at the elections clause, but certainly what kinds of uh, kinds of system structures can we create that can achieve this ultimate goal of certainly uh, having high participation as well as you know universal suffrage. Thank you so much. And, and speaking of sort of being more imaginative in how we approach this, um, you know, I, I would love to talk a little bit about the Alexander case time permitting, but sort of I, I, at this point, I, I think it'd be helpful to maybe bring back in what Terrence, you were referencing about States Voting Rights Acts um, and developments in States Voting Rights Acts. And so, um, you know, this has been a, a pretty major development in the voting rights space is as the Federal Voting Rights Act has been interpreted in a narrower, narrower fashion. Um, you know, California kind of led the way with a, you know, a broader, more protective Voting Rights Act under the state, uh, state constitution, state law. Um, and so they've, uh, various states have continued to adopt these. Um, you know, we've seen them in uh, Virginia, Oregon, Washington, uh, New York, recently in Connecticut. Um, so Terrence, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about sort of this growth of this approach, this reform approach, State Splitting Rights Act, um, sort of where we're seeing progress and what Milligan might mean for, for that. Oh, absolutely. And we should, to start off, we should clarify that there are states that have what they term voting rights acts, but aren't necessarily voting rights acts in the way we think of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. New Mexico, for instance, just passed a Voting Rights Act this last, in 2023, but I wouldn't necessarily term it a Voting Rights Act because it misses some key components that I think have to be in a Voting Rights Act. One, remedies for um, political subdivisions of the state, or at least the ability of uh, residents of the state to file suit and through a private right of action if there's a local political subdivision that is violating voting rights. And normally we think of that as um, passing restrictive voting laws, such as voter ID laws, or limiting the ability of people to register, time, place, and manner of elections, those types of things, uh, multi-language um, ballot access. Uh, if the bill doesn't necessarily protect those things, it then provides real remedies um, for those voters, then I don't necessarily deem it a voting rights bill um, in a traditional sense. And New Mexico is one of those states that I kind of put over here a little bit sorry, over here, just a little bit so you could see my hands completely. California, Washington, Oregon, Virginia may not really be in that category either. It's kind of kind of shaky, um, but Virginia, New York, um, and now Connecticut all have state voting rights acts, which all have uh, very similar um, provisions in them. Uh, requiring local governments with a history of discriminatory voting practices to obtain pre-clearance, which is what we had previously under the VRA. Um, right of private action and then multilingual language assistance, as I said earlier, those are the kind of like the hallmarks of this thing. New York and Connecticut probably should be considered the standard bearers now because they benefit from the most recent thinking, best practices, in this area and Connecticut probably should be more of the standard bearer at this point, nothing against New York, but Connecticut um, kind of built upon what New York did. One of the things that I find really good about what we're seeing in these is that the state bills have broadened 
the, the, the spectrum of remedies that are available um, to plaintiffs in these cases, which is very important. It's the John Lewis bill, and, or, and VRA will be 58 this weekend. And the, the VRA, as, VRA, as it was originally um, drafted through a series of compromises, really has limited remedies that are available to voters. And anybody who's been in the legislative process understands why. You just don't get something pure. And also, 58 years ago, there was still some uh, hesitancy to provide broader remedies. And uh, Deep South senators and, and Congress people kind of fought hard against it in LBJ. Uh, so he did a good job. He also still was a creature of his time. And there were some things he was still willing to give away. So at the, in the current state of play, the state VRAs are probably the way to go. Both good and bad, because I don't want us to give up on this idea that there need to be federal protections for voting rights. Because your ability to vote should not be based, and your right to vote should not be based on geographic location. I don't think the 10th Amendment ever contemplated the idea that certain core rights or protections should stop at a state border. And elections are one of those things. And I'll, I'll end with this so that other people can jump in. I was watching Ted Lasso. I finally got around to watching season three of Ted Lasso. And one of the things that, and I haven't had a chance to verify this, what Ted Lasso said, but I'm going to trust it to be true. He says in one in one episode where they're trying to like change the way that they, um, um, their formations into something called total football. He says in Japanese culture, they tie red, everyone's assumed to be tied to their soulmate to a red string that's kind of tied to their finger, an invisible red string. In democracy, it's tied to voting through an invisible red string because there can't be a functioning democracy if people don't have ability to exercise their franchise fully. Democracy and access to the ballot box that's unimpeded, unnecessarily unimpeded, they're soulmates. And Dr. King talked about this in a 1964, I think, column that he wrote in the New York Times Magazine about give us the vote. He talks about the heartbeat of democracy has to be the vote. And the brilliant piece about State Voting Rights Act acts is that at least at the state level, there are some people who understand that the heartbeat of democracy has to include the right to vote. Thanks so much, Terrence. So in the interest of, of tying the uh, red string stronger, uh, I would love to do a quick lightning round here. Uh, so election law professors, uh, and, and I would say hashtag relationship goals power couple, Ruth Greenwood and Nick Stephanopoulos uh, have argued that there should be further experimentation with states voting rights act. So as you said, Terrence, sort of there was the best practice, then New York improved upon the best practice, then Connecticut improved upon the best practice. So what we're really seeing here is a lot of imagination and innovation and, and saying, you know, we can totally recreate this to be what we want it to be. And so, um, you know, I'd love to go sort of panelist by panelist, if you have thoughts on this, you know, what would what would you like to see uh, in the next State Voting Rights Act, right? I think, you know, Michigan is pursuing one, you know, there's, there's, uh, Maryland is interested in a, in a Voting Rights Act. And so there's a lot of, you know, people are really catching on. And so now now's a good chance to plug. What would what would you like to see in, in Michigan and Maryland and, and other states that are uh, picking these up? So Chris, maybe I'll uh, start with you. Yeah, the thing that comes, first of all, um, I think this is, I'm the last one to say it, but I mean, just as strongly as everyone else that it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here with this panel and, and with you all today. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is something that Terrence said with respect to the private right of action is absolutely essential for any state voting rights act because um, private right of action is what gets you to the table to enforce these laws. As Professor Daniels was talking about, what's going on in Alabama right now is very much an example of what can happen when even when you have a binding court order, the people in charge of implementing a law are not particularly interested in, in following that interpretation or in ceding the power that following the court's order would require them to do. And so if you don't have the ability to even start the conversation without a kind of grant of authority from the people who hold the power currently, then you can't, you can't get anywhere. And um, 
without a without a private right of action, these these laws are necessarily limited because you are limiting who has the ability to invoke them and who has the ability to um, bring their protections to bear. So a private right of action and um, seeing, I think you've seen New York do this a little bit. I believe some of the other states who have enacted these laws recently as well have done so. Seeing a relaxation of, of what the pleading requirements are for vote dilution, what the prima facie case that you have to make out is, um, is also essential to getting towards a robust understanding of, of what it means to have that equal vote and the equal ability to elect and influence policy. So those are the two things that jump to mind for me immediately are lowering the, the barrier to entry for who has the ability to invoke these protections and to seek a court um, enforcing them on their behalf. And I think a private right of action and a um, reduction in the pleading requirements that are necessary to make out that case are two steps in that direction. Thanks, Chris. So this is a, the, the wish list spoken from a true voting rights litigator uh, is, is make sure you protect the cause of that provide private cause of, cause of action. And if you could lower our pleadings requirements, that would be that would be great. Uh, Professor Charles, do you have a, a thought on what would you like to see in states, state voting rights acts going? Sure. So look, a few things. The first thing is um, establishing voting as a fundamental right in the state, uh, removing all barriers uh, from the individual and burns on the individual to the government. So automatic registration uh, or same day registration, right? Sort of what it, the rules, uh, making sure that either polling places or voter drop boxes, whatever mechanism that facilitates the ability of the voter um, to participate, um, doing, enabling and doing that. So removing the cost, shifting costs from the individual to the state. Um, then thinking about electoral structure. So uh, Terence was talking earlier about proportionality, uh, right? So some mixed member proportional districts, right? But experimenting with electoral structures to assure that um, at, at the state level, to assure that voters have as, as much as possible within their participatory rights, um, equal voting power within that particular context. Um, maybe even include professionalizing and including a mechanism for um, election administration so that there is a nonpartisan professional mechanism that can't be captured by the government or by public interest um, that has a responsibility for administering and that is dynamic, right? That is the ability to, to, to adapt and adjust and promulgate rules um, to address change circumstances. So, you know, those are the, the three things that I think to me should be relatively uniform, right? That every state has to say, voting is a right in our state um, and it is our responsibility and this is what we mean by it. Uh, so that way we're not putting the burdens on the voter. We And then um, there's a structure, elect thinking about electoral structures to assure that um, the pro question of, of voting power and then um, administration. So I think at, at the very least, those are the four basic things um, that, that I'd like to see. This is, I'm liking this wish list. This is, this is going in a good direction. Uh, Professor Daniels, do you have any thoughts on what you would like to see in state, state voting rights acts going forward? Well, I'm actually working with the Campaign Legal Center as a consultant. We're working in Maryland and in Michigan and other places. Uh, and, and certainly one of the things that I want to see is, more, is oversight. Right, it's almost a, a codification of certainly Section Five on the state level, right? Where there's a where there's a review process, a vetting process of any and all voting changes, um, and that they have to be um, certainly reviewed to ensure that they do not discriminate against any particular community of voters. I certainly agree with all the other things that uh, Guy and Chris said as well, um, but I certainly think that having that having um, Having the uh, oversight does a couple of things, which provides notice to communities that these changes are about to occur. And I think it needs to be preemptive, just as it was with Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, so that you know you, you get the communities get notice about these changes, have an opportunity to be heard, uh, have an opportunity to learn about them, an opportunity to respond, uh, and that they and that it is determined that these that they do not you know put. Um, particularly communities of color in a worse position, which was certainly the standard under section five. And, uh, and, and once that is demonstrated, then those, the, the legislation can, can go forward. 
Thank you. Uh, Terrence, do you have any thoughts that would you'd like to see? Yeah, so on that, I don't um, repeat anything anyone said because I agree with all of them. I, I believe that there should be stronger redistricting protection. Some states have done a, a better job than other states with independent redistricting commissions, but I'm going to flag one of the things in the um, Fair Representation Act that Fair Vote is advocating for, which is independent redistricting commissions and actually stronger language in every state uh, protecting minority communities against packing and cracking. Um, again, continuing in private right of action and redistricting cases. Um, so that's that's what I'm going to argue for, uh, and, a, and a reaffirmation of the major principles of redistricting against racial gerrymandering and also against political gerrymandering. That we just have straight up redistricting uh, without all the gamesmanship that really looks at those principles of contiguity, communities of color, sorry, communities of interest, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Terrence. Um, so there was another major case uh, this past term, uh, election law case, Moore v. Harper. Uh, Chris, you were sort of involved on the ground uh, on this case um, this past term. And so I was wondering if you could give us sort of some background on that case, what your experience was like, um, and, you know, a sort of a, a recitation of what the court held so people have a sense of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Moore v. Harper is a case that arose out of a state court uh, challenge to North Carolina's redistricting plans that were adopted at the end of 2021, when most states around the country were redistricting. Um, and those claims were brought in state court um, under the state constitution of North Carolina um, on a few different theories, but all of which, or almost all of which, addressed whether or not partisan gerrymandering was permissible under the state constitution. In North Carolina. And so that that strategy, that technique actually has its roots in a Supreme Court case from a couple of years ago called Common Cause v. Rucho, where uh, plaintiffs, um, including plaintiffs represented by folks at my organization, Southern Coalition for Social Justice, um, were seeking a ruling from federal courts that partisan gerrymandering was unconstitutional under the federal constitution. And the Supreme Court of the United States held um, in 2019, five to four, that partisan gerrymandering was not justiciable under the federal constitution, was not saying that it was permissible, but was saying that federal courts have no role to play in policing the boundaries of partisan gerrymandering. But what the majority did say in that 2019 decision was uh, state courts might be an avenue that is available to plaintiffs who are seeking a remedy for that. Um, so that's exactly what we did. We went to state court. Us, uh, we represented common cause in the litigation and there were two other plaintiff groups. Um, that all challenged the state legislative and congressional maps as unconstitutional partisan gerrymanders under North Carolina law. Um, and we went to the North Carolina Supreme Court in February of 2022. The North Carolina Supreme Court held that partisan gerrymandering did violate the state constitution and struck down all three of those redistricting plans um, on that basis and started remedial proceedings to use for the 2022 elections that were approaching in the fall. Um, now, on the state legislative maps, uh, there was no federal hook for the uh, legislature to challenge that ruling um, to the United States Supreme Court. But on the congressional plan, um, the legislature pursued um, what is called the independent state legislature theory, which is based on a hyper literal reading of the elections clause of the federal constitution, which delegates the power to regulate federal elections to the state legislatures in the various states and said, when that clause says um, state legislatures, it means only state legislatures, that there is no bounds on that power except as announced in the federal constitution. And so what that means, the legislature argued, is that the state, the state Supreme Court had no ability to tell us that what we were doing violated the state constitution because the state constitution doesn't apply in this context. That was the argument that they were making to the United States Supreme Court. Um, so the Supreme Court declined to enter a stay in that case, so the, the maps went forward for 2022, but in June of last year, uh, granted cert in the case and set it for argument to take place in December on that question, on whether the elections clause means that state legislatures are unbound by their state constitutions when they're regulating federal elections. Um, and so one of the main things that the case turned on uh, is whether or not that was the understanding of the folks who enacted the elections clause. 
Um, setting aside the, the wisdom or merits of that particular theory of interpretation, that is what the Supreme Court has uh, decided to, how they've decided to answer constitutional questions. And that was a question that no one had ever thought to ask or do serious investigation into, mostly because it seems so self-evident that a state legislature was bound by their state constitution when they were lawmaking. But um, as soon as the case was granted cert, um, the everybody got to work looking into the history and trying to figure out what folks understood that to mean at the time. And the historical investigation revealed that overwhelmingly uh, states legislatures were understood to be bound by their state constitutions, even when regulating federal elections. And so that was a key piece of the argument that we made to the United States Supreme Court. And um, by a six to three decision in June, so just a couple of months ago, uh, the court agreed. They said, of course, state legislatures are bound by their state constitutions when they are regulating federal elections. Um, historical practice confirms this. And it, it's, of course, makes sense because state legislatures are creatures of their state constitutions. So they announced a couple of, of rules about when a state legislature might be unconstitutionally cut out of that process, or maybe announced rules is too strong of a statement. But they suggested that there may come a point where a state legislature is impermissibly removed from that process too much, but they declined to announce when that might happen. And they also said that there may come a time where a state court interpreting its own state constitution goes too far and that that violates the elections clause. And they also declined to announce precisely when that would take place. But all in all, they reaffirmed that what was up until 2022, an uncontested principle of, of American constitutional law, which is that a state legislature is a creature of its state constitution and the rules of that state constitution apply. Thanks, Chris. And so but I know we're, we're uh, starting to run low on time. One more question before we get to uh, question and answer um, from the audience. Could you talk a little bit about, or really anyone on the panel, sort of what the decision in Morby Harper you think means for election reformers or, um, you know, because I think there was a question as to what it meant for state level independent redistricting commissions like Arizona's commission and stuff, or say the Alaska system, final five voting, things like that, what the implications could have been uh, and what you think they are. Yeah, so I can start real briefly and then happy to, to have other folks jump in. But um, I think what it, what it means is that, and the court declined to rewrite the rule, fundamental rules of American democracy. And I don't think that you have to, to give them more credit than that. Um, they, they said that, yes, how it has always worked is how it will continue to work for the future. And what that means is that state constitutions and state law is still available as a path for reform, as a path for partisan gerrymandering provisions, as a path for in implementing an independent redistricting commission. These, these are avenues that were previously always understood to be available and under the Supreme Court's decision from uh, just under 10 years ago in the Arizona independent redistricting case, which upheld the constitutionality of independent redistricting commissions under the elections clause. Um, it, this case reaffirms that that will continue to be a pathway forward for these types of reforms. So this is still an avenue that's available to folks. Um, but the court... The court did not, I mean, I think there's there's a sense um, amongst folks that between Moore and Milligan that there was really existential threats to democracy at the at the Supreme Court this term. And those understandings of those cases are completely correct. If the court had come out in the opposite direction on either of those cases, it would have been huge blows to what remains of the legal protections for voting rights in, in the country. But um, the fact that the court declined to rewrite those rules does not make the Supreme Court a defender of democracy, and it does not mean that we have the law that we need with respect to voting rights. It means that what we still have, which I think many people, most people, uh, recognize is woefully inadequate to the need that exists across the country for protections for voting rights, what we have isn't going away. The court declined to sweep away what remains, but that doesn't mean that what we have is enough, and that doesn't mean that there's not a, a need for future reform. And so, um, the energy and the need for that energy is still very much a live question in the state of American democracy. Thank you, Chris. So, so still, still room on the ground for reformers and advocates and organizers to continue writing the end to Act Two, uh, and it's and again, it's up to us to keep keep that writing going. So, uh, let's turn to some audience questions. Uh, we have a question. 
uh, from Paige asking if we want to change to um, proportional voting systems. Um, Paige says for U.S. Congress, or really I would say for, for any state, maybe state legislatures uh, as well, can that be done state by state or would that require federal rule changes? Um, so op open to whoever might be interested in, in that, if anyone wants to step forward. Looks like Terrence. Or I saw an unmuting, so I didn't mean to volunteer you, Terrence. Uh, it's Zoom world these days. If you unmute, you're you're putting yourself up for uh, being the answerer. I know. I, I I should have realized the Zoom rules. I was trying to sit at the back of the classroom, but I didn't realize that when you unmute, you make yourself available uh, to answer a question. I'm going to use that in my class at the University of Redlands. Um, if you unmute, you have to answer my question. Uh, that's my new rule. Uh, if any of my students are watching, uh, I. I it's, it's a it's a both and answer actually depending on what you're trying to do uh, if you want to expand the size and i think the only way it works at the federal level is that it requires federal legislation because for you to have better proportionality at the federal level i think we would have to expand the size of the u.s congress um, especially the house of representatives to make it more representative um, and for and also to really start thinking about multi-member districts um, at the federal level, I believe that would require um, federal um, legislation. Not I believe I'm being so lawyerly. I believe um, it would require federal legislation. States a different question. Um, whatever your state wants to do um, at the state legislative level, state changes, state legislature could change it, or if your states. Um, benefits from having citizen initiatives that could be done at the citizen initiative level. Yeah, I agree with Terrence. I mean, you know, the Senate is baked into the Constitution. The House is a function of the Uniform Congressional uh, District Act. Um, and then the states can do whatever they, the states want to do for their state uh, House or their state Senate or their state legislature or localities. We've certainly seen some localities go down the route of proportionality. So depending upon what level that you're trying to go at will depend on the type of um, legislation or constitutional amendment uh, that you need. Uh, and so I think that's the those are the types of questions that people will have to take on. I think the benefit of doing things at the state level is at least you get experimentation and we see how it works. It enables people to get used to different types of reform. So for many, many years in, in the American context, the concept of proportionality was viewed as essentially adopting a, a totalitarian communist uh, system and structure. Uh, and so getting people used to this, that this is actually a pro-democracy idea um, is uh, critically important. And so that might um, uh, argue in favor of experimentation at the state level first, before then thinking about um, either uh, national legislation or congressional um, amend, uh, um, federal um, um, uh, amendment uh, to the Constitution in order to then think much more broadly about concepts of representation, uh, expansion, and proportionality. Thank you, Professor Charles. So I know we're 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 really coming up on four. I want to <laughs> ask another question, but. We've got some really good questions that I know will take more than two minutes, like what about mandatory voting requirements and how about using Section 2 of the 14th Amendment to strict congressional districts from states that disenfranchise voters? Love these questions. Very good questions uh, that I'm sure our panelists would love more than 15 to 30 seconds to comment on. So uh, we, we will be um, responding to questions, fair vote will. Uh, after this as well. So they will not go entirely unanswered and we'll be sure to share them with our panelists if there are anything that uh, the panelists want to share as well. Um, since we are in the last sort of minute here, maybe I'll go ahead and uh, start wrapping up here. Um, first, I just want to thank our panelists so much for sharing your time, sharing your knowledge, your expertise, your experience uh, with us here today. Uh, I do want to do some quick social media shout outs. Uh, if you want to hear more, uh, from the folks on this panel. Uh, Professor Daniels' is, Twitter is at Gilda underscore Daniels, uh, and website is gildadaniels.com. Uh, uh, Terrence Carroll is at Speaker Carroll, uh, 
Speaker of the House, Carol. Uh, so at Speaker Carol, that's on Twitter and threads. Um, Chris Shenton is at Chris Shenton one on Twitter. I'm sorry, Chris Shenton, that apparently Chris Shenton without the one was taken. That's that's the worst. I hate when that happens. Um, and I am at G Mike Parsons on Twitter. Uh, he, I believe you're on you're on Twitter. You're, you're on Twitter, right? I don't have your handle in here. So let me see if do you want to share your I, handle? I, I am a lurker, Prof. Guy Charles. <laughs> so, so he does. He's saying he doesn't want to be followed on Twitter. I, do, I don't understand this, Guy. This is the opposite of what you do on Twitter. So, um, thank you again so much uh, for joining us in this conversation about the Supreme Court and election reform. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. We'll be posting this video on YouTube afterwards and our social channels in the coming days. Again, that's youtubecom fairvote and at fairvote on Twitter or X, uh, whatever you'd rather. So please share with anyone who might be interested or watch it again if you like. Thank you again, everyone. Take care.